The majority of adult animated sitcoms in the U.S. still follow in the footsteps of The Simpsons, which has most of the characteristics I outlined above. Like, think about the presence of musical numbers in so many animated sitcoms. There's no real reason for the Family Guy or Bob's Burgers gangs to burst into song, save for the fact that it's what The Simpsons did and became known for. At least the music on Bob's is frequently terrific. But many newer animated sitcoms are working hard to step out of The Simpsons' very large shadow. Sure, shows like Bojack Horseman and Rick and Morty have a little Simpsons DNA in their mix, but that's mostly because everything on TV does. And increasingly, they're bursting out of that format and trying their own things, whether via an increasingly dark and dramatic serialization, Bojack, or a willingness to do just about anything to tell the great story, Rick. To be sure, I'm grossly oversimplifying a large multifaceted section of the animation industry that's only getting more and more complicated with every day. But the reason I'm boiling it down like this is to highlight what Big Mouth does that breaks with The Simpsons format and makes the series as good as it can be. Every story the show tells is essentially the same as every other story the show tells. At its core, Big Mouth is just the simple and straightforward story of how living through puberty is an absolute nightmare. And because its main characters are kids who are doing just that, the show can examine the experience from as many angles as possible. That's where it departs from the younger, puberty-age teens on shows like King of the Hill. By the time season two is over, characters will have started to explore a burgeoning bisexuality or maybe even pansexuality, shamefully been discovered masturbating with a stuffed animal, felt guilty about slut-shaming their friends and spent an entire episode performing a series of comedic sketches about Planned Parenthood. I admired the intent of the Planned Parenthood idea, but found it stopped the season dead in its tracks, a hit the show needed a couple of episodes to recover from. Oh, and the great David Thewlis joins the voice cast as someone called the Shame Wizard, as the series also deepens its large ensemble of personified emotions and human experiences. There's a depression kitty voiced by Jean Smart. And Maya Rudolph is basically giving one of TV's best performances as the hormone monstrous who hangs out with young Jessie, and she's doing it with only her voice. At almost every turn, Big Mouth looks at what happens when whole parts of your brain that you didn't even know were there start making their presence known and totally fucking up your life. And in both seasons of the show, its relentless focus on this very specific part of life extends to its plotting, it sets up lots of little stories about what the various kids are going through, then sends them crashing together at a big gathering near the end of the school year. In season 2, it's a big school lock-in. I don't know if Big Mouth is as tightly plotted in season 2 as it was in season 1, or if I just felt the show's desire to get all of its characters under the same roof a bit more forcefully this time around. The Shame Wizard, also, struck me as hit and miss, simply because the show hasn't yet figured out how to walk a line between hoping its characters will be shameless while also accepting that some degree of shame is necessary to keep society on track. Season 2 tries to do both, without finding any real balance between them. Notably, the Shame Wizard character did finally click for me when the show paired him up with the utterly guileless coach Steve. But I really loved Season 2's willingness to dig